From the CUBE studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a CUBE Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome to this special CUBE Conversation. Always love when we get to talk to founders of companies when they're drilling into uh, some interesting technologies. Uh, want to welcome a new guest to the CUBE as well as one of our CUBE alumni uh, sitting right next to me on the screen. First of all, we have Martin Casado, who is a general partner with Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, Martin, great to see you. It's great to be here. And you've brought along uh, Mike Del Balso, who is the co-founder and CEO of Tecton, uh, recently out of stealth, uh, going to dig into a lot of the ML uh, discussion. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. All right, so Mar Martin, look, you, you're, you're no, uh, uh, no stranger to being a founder yourself. Uh, we, we've loved having you on the cube over the years. Um, I, I have to get, since we're getting you on here in 2020, we of course need to start with the fact that there's a global pandemic going on. Um, yeah. And I'm curious from you know, your standpoint, from an investment standpoint, and looking at technology, uh, you know, how does this make it a little bit different in 2020, say, than uh, you would have thought coming into the year? Yeah, so I, I think, um... I think there's kind of a near-term answer and a long-term answer. I think the near-term answer is people don't really understand what um, the broad impact is going to be. Um, and so, uh, you know, companies in the portfolio and the guidance that we do is to, um, you know, be conservative with cash. Um, you know, let's see how Q2 plays out. Um, and then let's figure out, you know, the right way to kind of operate the company in light of the macro changes. Long term, however, it's very clear that every digital transformation project right now is being fast tracked. And as a result, we think it's a huge boon to infrastructure and it's who been for the software, right? Like where in the past you could deal with kind of legacy setups that were on prem, this is just not the case anymore. Um, so, you know, take for, you know, you know, a company like Tekton, you know, um, you know, Mike's company, you know, like there's a lot of conversations that happen now where the company's like, wow, we really need to have, you know, uh, our infrastructure digitized and it all needs to be in the cloud and it all needs to be remote and, and so forth. And so we're actually seeing a ton of tailwinds even though there's uncertainty on the macro environment in the near term. Yeah, uh, you, you make some great points, Martin. Absolutely, you know, the companies that have, have actually gone through some digital transformation, the goals of that is number one, I should be data driven. Number two, I should be able to be much more agile. And that's what we need right. in uncertain times is to be able to react fast and answer it. Um, you know, Mike, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I've talked to plenty of companies, you can't necessarily choose when's the right time to launch a company, when the right time to do an IPO, trying to time the market. But, um, you know, sorry to say, you know, interesting times are, are upon us. So um, let's talk a bit about, you know, Tekton. Give us a little bit of, you know, your background, uh, the team, uh, the core team, I believe, coming out of Uber with the Michelangelo project uh, that, that led to Tekton. Yeah, great. So, uh, so at Tekton, we really focus on what we call operational machine learning, which is really about helping organizations really use machine learning, machine learning in a, an applied context, really uh, powering customer experiences, um, powering business processes, things that really make it to production. And so we help we help uh, these machine learning AI efforts get past the finish line. And uh, a little a bit about the background uh, of me, I, I used to work at Google. At Google, I was a product manager for the machine learning teams that power the ads auction. So the, 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 the models that choose which ads to show and run in real time and are highly productionized and are really core to the business. Uh, and then, and then I, I was at Uber after that and, and uh, at Uber helped start the first centralized machine learning team. And it was, uh, it was really, really the whole journey for Uber, going from just starting to getting to, uh, you know, to tens of thousands of models in production. And a big component of that was a lot of the technology that we built there, the platforms and infrastructure that we built to support the different business teams to be able to, to embed machine learning into their products. And so you know, we're talking about all these very applied use cases real-time fraud detection, ETA estimation, the search pricing, all these things that you think about uh, with Uber. So, um, so through that journey of supporting and helping them get to you know, 100 with machine learning, uh, we built up this platform called Michelangelo, which is really a machine learning 
uh, it's really an end-to-end -end machine learning platform and uh, learned a lot of lessons as we helped out dozens of teams go through the full life cycle. Start, starting a project, hey, what, is this, what does this mean? What is my business problem? How does it translate to a machine learning problem? All the way to uh, you know, having a model in production monitored uh, and fully, like really fully productionized and kind of uh, growing core to that business. So we learned a lot of uh, lessons um, from building that Tecton. My co-founders are the, the other leaders of that project. And uh, you know, we, we learned a lot of uh, really important lessons that, uh, that, that lead to the success of these machine learning projects. And we're um, now focused on helping a lot of other organizations really start up their machine learning efforts and get these things into production. Yeah, Martin, maybe you could give us a little bit of context here. You know, when I think about, you know, repeatability of solutions, how much they scale, there's only so many Googles and Ubers out there. Um, yeah. And, you know, when I look back at the big data world, you know, there wasn't a lot of repeatability. It seemed like everything was custom. Uh, so, you know, what, what did you see with Tecton? What are you looking at in the ML space uh, that made them such an attractive investment? Sure. So maybe, uh, maybe let's just pull back and talk about what's going on in systems and infrastructure in general. And I actually think this is probably the biggest shift certainly I've seen in my career, which is it used to be if you looked at a system, let's say it's Uber, but whatever system, the correctness of that system and the performance of that system and the compliance of that system and the security was dictated by the code that you wrote, right? You wrote bad code, you made bugs, you had vulnerabilities in your code, that would dictate the system. But more and more, that's actually not the case. I mean, these days, kind of performance, accuracy, security, compliance is actually dictated by the data that you feed into these, right? And so, like, um, you know, you you know, you create these models, you feed the data models, the data gives you output, and you know, the data that you feed in and like your workflow around those models are really dictating, you know, things like pricing or things like fraud. These really important things, and unlike code, we don't have the, the tools to manage data in the same way. And so if you think of it, we're moving kind of from this code economy to this data economy, data more and more dictates the, correct, dictates the correctness of all of these systems. And we're talking about trillions of dollars of market cap. Um, but if you actually look at the tooling around it, it still feels like, you know, the seventies around code, which is like, you know, you've got deep dumps and you've got um, a lot of tribal knowledge. And so we've been tracking this trend for a long time. We're investors in Databricks, as you know. Um, you know, we've got a large data portfolio. I mean, it's very obvious if you look at what's happening with the cloud data warehouses, if you think like, you know, like Redshift, BigQuery, and Snowflake, like, you know, the world is going data and, 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 and pulling, extracting information out of data. Um, and so on the backdrop of that, we're like, okay, so, you know, you need to be able to think of data like you think of code and have the tooling around it that help makes um, the lives of people working with this stuff simpler, you know, especially for the core use cases, which is ML and AI. Um, and to that end, you know, I think that, that this is broadly known in the industry, but like looking in the leading companies is like a crystal ball into the future, right? Because they tackle a lot of the problems before the rest of the industry did. And Michelangelo was very well known as the leading project in this. Space. I mean, it had a broad set of respect um, from the community. It kind of, you know, created this notion of a feature store, which has now been replicated. Um, and so, you know, really, this is a like 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 the preeminent project in one of the biggest macro uh, transformations. And then, you know, uh, beyond that, we met the team. They're fantastic. We've got great chemistry. We've got a lot of similar backgrounds. And so, the investment was uh, pretty straightforward from that. But I, I do think it's important to frame it in the context of this macro shift that's going on. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it it's been uh, you know can't be overstated how important data is. I do think we need a new analogy, probably, with what happened with the global pandemic. Everybody was talking about data being the new oil, and oil's pretty cheap right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and data is definitely not losing its value. Um, yeah. Mike, when, when I read some of the you know the discussion uh, about you know Tecton enables data scientists to turn raw data into production-ready features and predictive singles, uh, signals, you know, it sounds really impressive. So help us understand kind of the, the, the core thing that you do and you know where, where we are in the, the product life cycle. Great. Well, when so a machine learning application, there's fundamentally two components to it, right? There's a model that you have to build that's going to make the decisions given a certain set of inputs, and you and then there's the features which end up being those inputs uh, that that model uses to make the decision. And uh, common machine learning infrastructure stacks 
uh, really are split into uh, two layers. There's a model management layer and a, a feature management layer. And that's a, 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 an emerging pattern in some of the, from the, the more sophisticated machine learning uh, stacks uh, that are out there. And what, what we built at Michelangelo, we really had uh, this model management layer, this feature management layer, and we recognized the feature management layer was, uh, was the, the thing that really allowed us to go from uh, you know, not just zero to one, but one to one to n, and scale out machine learning across a number of different use cases, and allow individual data scientists to own uh, more than just one model in production. And so, so really, what, what's at the core of that is uh, a, a few components. Um, the first is just feature pipelines. So this is these are data pipelines that plug into uh, the business's raw data, be it batch, streaming, real-time data and turn those into features that are these predictive signals that models consume. The second part of that is a feature store, which catalogs these feature transformations, catalogs these pipelines, and stores the, um, uh, the output uh, raw data, or the, the output feature data. And then the third component is feature service, making those features accessible to a data scientist when they're building their models and to the models in the production environment so they can make these decisions sometimes needed, uh, needed in milliseconds for real-time decisioning that is, uh, is quite common in a, in a lot of um, high-value machine learning applications. So what TechCom really is, is a, it's a data platform for machine learning uh, that manages all of the feature data and feature transformations that uh, allow an organization to, uh, to share the predictive signals, these features across use cases and really catalog these and understand what they are. And secondly, get these into production so so they don't get hung up um, in that final stage right before they're trying to cross the finish line with the machine learning project. All right, and and Mike, the, the product today, uh, my understanding, private beta, you, you do have some customers uh, at that point. What, what Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we're in private beta with uh, a, a number of customers. Um, we just went into full production with Atlassian uh, last month. Um, uh, a, a couple of other customers that I maybe shouldn't name on the air, but um, uh, but we are spending time uh, engaging in, in in kind of like deep hands-on uh, engagements with different teams who are really trying to set up their machine learning on the cloud, uh, figure out how to uh, get their machine learning in production, and it tends to be uh, teams that are trying to really use machine learning for operational use cases, really trying to drive real business decisions. Uh, and and uh, and power their product customer experiences and, and not as not as much uh, a lot of the kind of like research algorithm research stuff but we're really trying just trying to solve these core data problems that help uh, or that are preventing machine learning projects from being successful. Yeah, it, it was interesting, Martine. As I was listening to some of uh, what what Mike was saying, I'm like, okay, it's not quite the analogy of micro segmentation or separating the <laughs> control plane or the network plane and networking, but you know, there were some analogies there. What, what I, what I want to ask you though, um, is, you know, the, the role of data. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, talking to Andy Jassy a couple of years ago, uh, yeah. I, I, I asked him, you know, the, the flywheel for AWS for years was customers. You know, how many customers yeah. they could get. And, yeah. you know, I was wondering, does data become that new flywheel? And there's the center of gravities and the customers that can tap in and monetize what's going there. So yeah. I'm just curious your thoughts on, on, on that. Yeah. So I think, I think people don't appreciate how different data is than code. And so I just want to start there because I think it's, 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 it's uh, really germane to this topic. So listen, code is like a finite stage, right? It's like, it's lines of code, you can build it, you can modularize it, it's like building a house. And so the tools that you put around code kind of rein in what's already a fairly um, uh, low entropy system, like a fairly orderly system. Data, on the other hand, data is like the natural world. It's all of the complexity of the universe, right? It's the behavior of humans. It's, you know, it's temperature readings. <laughs> it's like, you know, and there is so much more complexity and there's so much more entropy in data that the way that you deal with it is so fundamentally different than you have to deal with. Code. 
And so we've had all of these, and, and so I just want to, I wanted to start that with, is we've had all of these analogies about data. Data is the new oil, data is where there's the value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of it's tautological, meaning, yes, of course there's value in data. Yeah. Yes, um, if you have proprietary access to data, you've got proprietary access to data. But what we don't really know is how do you take data and rein it in so you can use it in the same way that you use software systems? We actually don't even know how to do that. And so talking about things like data network effects and extracting data is a little bit preliminary because we still actually don't even understand like how much work it takes to mine insights from data. What I do know you need, I do know you need the tools to do it. And I do know that those, those, those tools are quite different. And so I think that we're now in this era of building the tooling that is required to extract the insight that data. And I think that's a very necessary step. And this is where Tecton comes in to provide that tooling. And I think once we have a better handle on that, then we can start asking these, these deeper questions, which I think are great questions, but are things like how defensible is data? Do you have network effects with data? Um, you know, can you put in a finite amount of effort and extract you know, signal at all times? Like how messy is data, et cetera? And so I think that's kind of where we are in this journey, which is exactly why you need companies like, like Tecton to help, to help answer this. All right, so Mike, uh, you know, th th there's been the promise of really unlocking data now. has been a really interesting dis discussion point for the last five or 10 years. The company is named Tecton. Uh, when I, I, I've read some of the blog posts and talk about the Cambrian explosion and changes there. So give us, you know, if we're looking forward, you've just come out of stealth, you know, what is success for Tecton two to three years out from now? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the biggest thing is we're, we're trying to help organizations recognize the, that their data it really is an asset and treat their features like assets. And uh, when we can get to a point where organizations that, you know, teams that want to use machine learning and production don't need uh, to throw a million data engineers at a problem. And when we get uh, to a point where uh, machine learning is not uh, a, a relegated to, a, to a, special, a special team of experts that are super expensive that you kind of leave in the corner of your building and hope they, hope they come back 18 months later with, uh, some, with uh, some project that, that uh, is showing some value, uh, that would be success for us. You know, we really are, are dead focused on the problems that are, that are preventing uh, these these projects just from just from uh, getting into production, and so uh, when we see the industry as a whole have seeing success uh, with these machine learning projects, I think we will have uh, our mission accomplished. All right, uh, Martino, I'll give you the final word as to you know the opportunity you see in front of Tecton. Um, I honestly think the the data industry is going to be 10x the compute industry i just think like with with compute you know you're you're building houses from the ground up and there's a ton of value there i think with data is you're extracting insight and value from the universe right it's like the natural system um and every company has data and lots of data and all of it has some information and so i think that this is a chance to be a very very pivotal company in um, democratizing access to, to, to data. So I think that the opportunity is enormous. Well, Martin, thank you for joining us again on the update. Mike, thank you. Welcome to being a CUBE alum. Definitely <laughs> hope to have you back soon to track the journey. Congrats on you know, step one out the door and uh, you know, best of luck going forward. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Sue. All right, be sure to check out thecube.net for the upcoming events that we have. Today they're all virtual, but the interviews are all there as well as all the archive. I'm Stu Miniman and thank you for watching theCUBE.